Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Monica Christensen. I'm Dean of Students here at Manhattan School of Music, and I'm hosting this week's MSM Perspectives panel. Uh, this panel is on student artists and social change, and I am privileged um, to be joined today by uh, several current and recent students um, who are involved in some very exciting things um, that have the potential to change the world through their art. Um, as a reminder to current students, you are eligible for setting the stage credit by uh, attending this seminar. And uh, we will be posting in the chat the information that you need. Um, you will have to fill out a form to get credit. Um, and the information that you need for that will be posted in the chat shortly. Um, I'm here today with uh, Gabriel Chakarji, Chakarji uh, who is an incoming student in jazz. Um, he is going to be a part of our master's program. Um, he's been working with Juan Villalobos, uh, who is a rising junior here at Manhattan School of Music, also in jazz. Um, and I'm delighted to be able to share with everyone today some of what they've been working on um, in a collaboration together. Um, I'm also joined today by Subia Mboya, who is a rising junior in our musical theater program. Um, I've had a uh, uh, I had a chance to have a delightful conversation with her just yesterday about some of the really exciting things that she's doing. Um, and I'm also joined today by Joseph Grosso, who is a recent graduate, um, also from our musical theater program, um, who used his time as, uh, he stepped forward really to be a student leader in his time at Manhattan School of Music. And through that student leadership position, um, engaged in a number of ways, um, in some advocacy work, um, and also in um, an artistic uh, effort uh, that unfortunately did not actually get performed due to, due to COVID-19, um, but, uh, but was an effort to think about a way to use art um, to make social change. Um, some of you may know that several weeks ago, MSM Perspectives featured um, faculty members and other, uh, other um, artists who are connected to Manhattan School of Music, um, who similarly joined us to talk about their efforts to create social change through their art. Um, and I found that a, a, a fascinating panel. Um, and I found it equally fascinating speaking with the four young people that have joined us here today um, to see that they are similarly um, moving both themselves and their art and their careers forward um, by staying true to their ideas about the change they want to see in the world, um, which is, is, I think, a very important um, lesson and inspiration for um, anyone who aspires to be in the arts. Um, so I'm very excited to share, to have them share with you their stories today. Um, as Dean of Students, our Student Affairs Division um, wants to make space for our students to explore all elements of the self and to help them think about the kind of musicians and citizens both that they want to be um, as they move through you know, the early stages of emerging adulthood into uh, their adult selves. Um, so we hope that we provide the space for experimentation um, but these students have found that space um, not only within MSM, but have also carved out spaces outside of MSM. And as you'll hear, they've even carved out special places for themselves within MSM um, to further their ideas and their, um, and their art. Um, so I'm very excited to hear from them today. Um, I wondered if we could start with Subia, who I um, spoke to yesterday. Um, and ask her to tell us a little bit about, I'm actually going to ask all of you one at a time, to tell us a little bit about um, some of the projects that you're working on, some of the ways that you think about making change through your art and outside of art, um, and then maybe a little bit about uh, the kinds of personal experiences that led you to have, that, you know, that shaped those efforts. Um, 
But Subi, if we could start just first with the question, um, can you tell us a little bit about, and maybe share with us a little bit about some current projects that you're working on? Yeah, so um, right now I'm actually finishing up the construction of my work of my play Agape, um, which is a story about college students um, in present day and all the trials they undergo because not only are they college students, but they're college students of color. And it talks about all of the, um, the conflicts that they face in the world and the flaws that they have to overcome, which were imposed on them through society and how they either succumb to those flaws or overcome them. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that work, which I started when I was 18 and I've been working on it for a bit. So yeah, I'm really excited to show it. I'm gonna do like a reading of uh, this year at school and hopefully we can do a little bit more, but because of COVID, you know, things are all over the place, understandably <laughs> so. Um, but you've but been I'm in really conversation with the production department, correct? You've been in yes. conversation with our production department? Oh, yes, 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 okay. definitely. So we're just waiting um, just to see how things really pan out in the world, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but in addition to that, this summer I'm working on Into the Woods, um, which is one of my favorite Stephen Sondheim musicals of all time and I'm playing the role of the witch, so that's gonna be pretty cool. Um, I like playing those crazy characters, I guess. <laughs> but it's gonna be lots of fun, so I'm looking forward to it, yeah. Um, and you told me a little bit yesterday about um, some work you're doing, um, making art with uh, children and teen teens. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm writing this um, collaborative uh, work with about, I would say there's like 15 of us and we age range between I think 14 to 50 or 60. Mm -hmm. And it's a project called Because We're Girls at Tada Youth Theater, which I know Joe's a part of. Um, Tada Youth Theater is a theater I grew up in. It's where I learned how to do everything that I learned how to do. And the work is really awesome because it's a musical centered around um, what it's like to be a girl in America and all the different trials that women go through and it's yeah it's really cool so I'm looking forward to it. That's great. Yeah. Um, just, Joseph why don't we turn to you then. Um, your experience um, I think hap some of what you've done has happened in a number of different settings and through a number of different vehicles um, but I think the one that I at least was most aware of was the work that you've done through a student organization at Manhattan School of Music. Um, so I'd love for you to tell us about that and about any other, um, you know, short-term or long-term projects uh, in the works that um, that you've turned to in part to give to give a voice to some of the change that you want to see in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so at Manhattan School of Music, I started two student organizations. Um, one was called Queer PBS, um, which stands for Queer People for the Betterment of Society. Um, and it was formally, uh, we kind of took uh, the Gay Straight Alliance, it was called MSM Gay Straight Alliance, and we just kind of amped it up, gave it a new name and a facelift and um, created this new organization. Um, so we, I worked with that, and then I also started a local chapter of Alpha Psi Omega um, which is a national theater honor society that's uh, recognized and accredited throughout the whole country. Um, but we just started a local chapter at our school. Um, and through both of those organizations, we worked our way towards doing advocacy work. Obviously with Queer PBS, it was focused on the queer community and with Alpha Psi Omega, it was within the theatrical community. Um, so I did a lot, I did a number of things with those organizations at the school. Um, with Queer PBS, we had fundraisers throughout uh, LGBT History Month, or LGBTQ plus History Month. Um, and we threw a ball each year that was a charity fundraiser for um, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. And we did a number of like education sessions talking about different issues and labels and things that the queer community, queer community faces today and in the past. Um, and then with Alpha Psi Omega, we were working on, um, right before the pandemic, we were working on Jesus Christ Superstar, um, which was uh, an inclusive cast production, meaning that, you know, 
Jesus was a woman, King Herod was a woman, um, I was playing Mary Magdalene. Um, so it was all kinds of turning things on their head uh, in terms of casting. Um, and unfortunately that production was halted because of the pandemic. Um, so we never saw that come to fruition, but we were starting into that. And Alpha Omega is still active at MSM. We have a new leadership team and they have a new set of people working towards continuing that mission of bettering the community um, through theater. Uh, and currently I'm just, you know, hanging out. <laughs> Um, you know, after I just graduated this past May and I, I told myself, I was like, okay, let's take some time off. <laughs> um, long term, I'm working on a, a podcast focused on um, queer history and culture. Um, and I am also working on a very long term, um, a theater company um, that would focus on queer theatrical works. Um, and queer actors and, and also education in that field. That's terrific, thanks. Yeah. Um, and Gabrielle and Juan, I don't know how you want to, if you want to take turns or how you want to present, uh, but can you tell us a little bit about what you've been working on together and apart? Sure, <laughs> uh, thank you for having us, first of all. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm really looking forward to to start the fall semester, um, since that will be my first semester. But I'm really happy to be here discussing about these issues with you guys. And yeah, Juan and I, and other community of Venezuelans uh, that live here in New York City, um, are part of this project called Venezuelan Motion, which is like a collective uh, band that, that we're um, forming and composing using many of our, you know, roots of our music, uh, Afro-Venezuelan music and folkloric Venezuelan music, uh, mixed with the New York sounds and the experience as immigrants that, that we've lived here um, approximately five years, six years, everybody's different, but uh, we want to talk about that and also focusing on the fact that we are kind of uh, first generation of, of what's called uh, the Venezuelan diaspora because of the whole crisis the last, for the last 20 years in, in our country. So we're trying to you know, bring some positive thoughts and, and express our experience as immigrants and, and try to relate to all the immigrants, uh, not only in the States, but around the, the world. Juan, we are going to... Yeah, well, as Gabriel said, uh, this is a project that it's been, you know, for a while, but uh, right now, for example, uh, with future projects, uh, we are in the making of a new album, uh, which is the first album of the, of the group itself. Um, this is thanks to, uh, well, uh, as I told you guys, Gabriel applied for a grant and we got it. And uh, so we are in the making of the album, thanks to the support of the uh, association, let's say like that. And uh, we were supposed to record already, but you know, all the pandemic and all the problems started. Uh, but yeah, we are doing it uh, like, you know, like we are recording in distance. And this project all uh, talks about a lot, as my, my, my colleague said, it talks about the Venezuelan diaspora, taking account that, for example, if we if we talk about, for example, Brazilian music, Cuban music, Peruvian music, these are uh, uh, music that was developed uh, all around the world, and a lot of people, for example, in our case, we are uh, jazz musicians. You can see a lot of artists and, and musicians that are mixing all this stuff, and they are not even from that country, you know? So mm -hmm. now I think it's the, now I think it's our turn, you know, because we are the first generation that's getting out, you know? Uh, when most, well, when almost the 10th, uh, sorry, when almost, like, yeah, like a quarter of the population has left the country, it's yeah. like, it's like a lot, you know? So uh, not only us, we, because we are here in New York together, and this group, is with a lot of friends of us too. 
uh, but there are also people in Peru, in, Ar in Argentina, uh, in Belgium, for example, you know, uh, that they are doing like their part two uh, in showing the people uh, our roots. So yeah, that's basically our mission and to the people to know our history as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Juan and Gabriel, you spoke to me the other day about um, the fact that, that your project has some roots, I think, in, um, in some tradition um, of, of uh, sort of culture keepers it was, the, was the word that came to me in English, although you used a Spanish word. Um, can you talk about, um, about the culture keepers and about um, you know, your, the ways that, that your project, I think, connects to that tradition? So because it seems to me that as you were looking for ways to express yourself artistically um, and to highlight for the world, I think, you know, we know that Venezuela is a place of some significant suffering right now. Venezuelans have gone through a considerable amount of, of suffering, but they also um, have, you know, strengths and have uh, in the diaspora have, 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 um, encountered, you know, other cultures that have been enriching, and um, and so your project, you know, brings to life and in a new way, some through jazz, um, a Venezuelan history. And I think I understood from our conversation that it's a, a way of highlighting, um, you know, the strength of the people and the resilience of the people, and. Um, when you were when you were looking to express these things, you had a particular tradition that um, you were aware of from your country that you saw yourself connecting to. Can you talk about that a little bit? Do you know what I'm re referencing? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for for mentioning that. Um, yes, we're we're paying homage to a whole culture that is you know it's kind of it's it's really old really ancient and it's the music that developed in our country with through so many different you know sufferings of people and mixture of people and specifically for example the we have the afro venezuelan music which is uh the music that developed only one day in a year which is the 24th of june which is when the spanish uh, uh and slavers uh, let the, all the slaves celebrate. It's, it was just one day a year um, that that they they let them, you know, play percussion, dance. Like it's you're free to do whatever you want, but you have to praise a Christian figure. So mm -hmm. that they uh, they celebrate San Juan, uh, San John, mm -hmm. but and this is something that repeats throughout. Uh, the, the Caribbean. Um, many, many countries celebrate San Juan on the 24th of June. And, and it's, it's really an, it's like an, an, like an ancestry that we have that many of, of these people still celebrate and it has a, a, a deep spiritual meaning. And it's, it's, you know, the meaning of freedom that one day that they had freedom to, to 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 chant and dance and celebrate their own culture and their own gods, but really they had to do it through San Juan, which is this Christian figure. But they were praising their own gods and and they were playing these drums and they were playing, singing these chants. And this is part of our history. And I think it's really important to create awareness, uh, not only of the diasporic uh, like cultures and music. Uh, Afro-Venezuelan music, but also bring awareness that there's also Afro-Peruvian, Afro-Cuban, Afro-Puerto Rican music. And these are really important um, concepts and really important parts of, of our culture that we want the world to know. And we want to, uh, to bring that into the conversation of all, everything that's happening now regarding uh, you know, social justice. So 
I want to I wanna give it to Juan because his father is one of these culture keepers. So he can definitely tell you about it. And Juan, can you, can you give us the name in Spanish? I'm sorry for not remembering the Spanish term. Oh yeah, the name, the name in Spanish will be cultores. Like C-U-L-T-O-R-E-S, cultores. So yeah, uh, basically, well, as uh, Gabriel said, my father is one of them. Uh, so the thing is that the, the culture in Venezuela is so wide, it's so big that uh, culture keepers are not like only, I mean, for example, my father, he, he knows about the Venezuelan culture, but on the west side of Venezuela, which is the place I'm from, uh, mm -hmm. right in the border with Colombia. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, among uh, uh, a friend mm -hmm. is another uh, a friend is another culture uh, keeper, uh, but in the central part of Venezuela, which we will be the capital, you know, which is the place where we celebrate uh, Saint John, as Gabriel said. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are, there are so many different rhythms and chants and and genres inside the Venezuelan music that. I haven't met the first person that is at, that knows everything, you know, because it's really, it's really big. So we we see culture keepers like like people from here, from the United States, for example, at MSM in the jazz program, see a person like Miles Davis or Louis Samson or Herbie Hancock, you know, that these are people that they help the genre, the music to uh, uh, to grow, you know. Uh, but by maintaining themselves attached to what they actually are, you know, the mm -hmm. culture keepers in Venezuela are, are kind of a similar, uh, are kind of in the similar way, you know, mm -hmm. in the sense that they are trying to preserve the culture. Yeah. Like, like, you know, like they are trying to preserve the chants. Uh, and there is a lot of that uh, music that has been lost with the time because you know right now we can record it, but maybe 70 years ago we couldn't, we wouldn't have the equipment to do yeah. it, you know. But now we are trying to do it, and it's not only Gabriel and me, but we have, a, as as you say, we have like a like a like a team, you know. To, and and Monica, to yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Just to jump in on that, you mentioned how are we connecting to these people? So we are collaborating with these culture keepers. Uh, in the U.S. with some of, some of these culture keepers that moved to the U.S. Right. Also some in Spain, like Carlos Tales, who moved to Spain around 10 years ago, I think. And some of the culture keepers in Venezuela, too, to collaborate, maintain this culture. And really, even if, because we're just musicians, even the maybe the economic help is not a lot, they are so happy that we are creating this awareness to the world of the beauty of their culture, even if they are maybe in a in a town in Venezuela that is poor currently, but they are very rich musically and culturally. So I think that, that we're creating this awareness in the world through this band uh, with them. So I think that's a positive uh, work. But I also understood from our discussion that uh, by that it's um, maybe a new direction. Um, to be uh, connecting through jazz and, and to the traditional culture um, and that that is something that has been has spoken to you both personally right that, that you've chosen jazz as, as to, 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 to explore your cultural heritage through a different heritage of jazz can you talk about that yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, well, as I said in the previous reunion, uh, when I first came to MSM, mm -hmm. I had a well. I've been having like you know a lot of jazz history classes, and learning about this culture helped me a lot to understand my own culture. It's it's actually it's actually funny, but uh, we are we are mostly we are kind of the same people, you know, like uh, in the sense that. For example, if you see the evolution of this genre we're talking about, uh, if you see the evolution of jazz right now, you will see that this was music, that it was actually folk music. It was music created by, by the people, for the people, and it was, uh, and we had a evolution, a significant evolution. Um, we are here now and we have all these kind of fusions 
with another genres from uh, from from a whole different countries and cultures, and I see uh, uh, we see that we we can do that, but with our roots, which which will be Venezuelan music, you know. For example, like jazz is part of your your folk music here in the United States. For example, yeah. why don't we why cannot we have like a university in Venezuela that can talk about Venezuelan music, for example, as you guys develop? So jazz has developed that much that now you guys have a uh, jazz program for example that wouldn't exist like 40 years ago for example so that's what what that's one learning about the the, the history of jazz the history of new orleans specifically i related myself somehow with my own history in venezuela you know and since my dad is a culture keeper uh he's always like every time i have a doubt or something I would call him like, hey, that I'm trying to develop this. What do you think? Is this kind of wrong? Do I have like, is this the specific groove? Is this the correct rhythm or something? And, uh, and not only my dad, like we have friends and we have people that, thank God, they are like glad to work with us and, to, and, and they are glad to help us as well, you know? So it sounds like um, you have had some of your own ideas musically that you've wanted to express, and also personally, um, your own take, I guess, on, on, um, on things that are valuable to you. Um, and you've advanced that music through connection with a, with a community, a family and community beyond. So that's been, I mean, I've been interested to hear a little bit about how I, I think um, everyone here on this panel is, um, you know, has, Start, is starting to have their vision heard by others. Um, Joseph uh, was interrupted, um, and you all were delayed, Juan and Gabrielle. Um, but uh, you know, how do how do young people find that path forward? How do they find spaces for performing what is important to them? And so it sounds like in, in your case, you turn to family and community to make that happen. Um, Subia, um, you have made spaces for yourself both inside MSM, or you're working on it anyway, and, um, and outside, and um, in part through um, a much more geographically uh, specific community, right? Uh, Gabrielle and Juan are talking about a community that's that's um, scattered now. Um, at least the part that you talked about, about the organization that you're a part of is a little more local. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you got, had, how you got the courage to write a play and to mm -hmm. put it out there? And, um, and how you went about finding space for your voice to be heard? As yeah. You um, my process, it began, I, I knew that I had to write the play because I heard this song um, by Nicholas Bertel, um, Agape, which was on If Beale Street Could Talk soundtrack, the movie, J uh, James Baldwin's book, which was turned into a movie. I heard the song and I was so moved by the music that I heard a whole story come out of it and the story was completely unlike the story that I have now. <laughs> but um, it was a story that was centered around love in the midst of so many outside tribulations and factors that one experiences because they are simply human, but then more specifically um, factors and trials and tribulations that one experiences because they are black. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as I was writing this play specifically this summer, um, I felt that I had to get the words out. I had to just keep going. I had to put them on the page because of the fact that what I'm writing about speaks kind of directly to what's happening in this country or has been happening in this country. Um, and so, so I think the courage more so came from the responsibility and the obligation. And I say that because I think this summer more than any before I've realized what the true purpose of an artist is and how we are, we are um, 
vehicles of our community. We are there as representation sometimes of our communities. And so it is our duty to use our voices and our art um, as, as you wonderful people are doing as well to tell our stories and to make sure that all of our voices are included and, and all of that great stuff. So yeah, I just had to write. <laughs> had to write. <laughs> so we talked about the possibility of having you share just a, a little bit of what you um, do a teeny bit, teeny reading. I, I was going to, um, I, I can pull it up very quickly. I will do that okay. if that's all right. Sure. Just give me one moment. Great. Great. Ah. I'll just turn to Joseph and then, um, and then we'll come back to you. Um, and Juan and Gabrielle, I know that you also have prepared some, um, a little bit of your music to share with us. So I will also come back to you so that we can hear it for ourselves. Um, Joseph, you know, I, I mentioned at the top of this discussion that you use some, some um, particular spaces in MSM to start to get your ideas out there. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to, um, to do that? and um, what it was like to use the, the student affairs, uh, student organization structures to um, start to enact some of the social change you wanted to see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we've had an infrastructure, obviously, at MSM in place for a while for student projects and for student organizations, and, and there's pathways to create and enact those things. Um, and, you know, I have for a long time thought that queer people, though we find comfort in theater, the, the theater's always been an accepting place for a lot of people. Um, you know, and, and that is starting to change now in terms of like the inclusive casting and, and more, uh, accepting more people has to happen. But mm -hmm. traditionally the theater has been on the, the forefront of, of social change and hopefully will continue to do that and make itself better in that way. Um, but I still, I, I felt a lot like uh, queer people were still kind of, and still are kind of like a trope in society you know, in terms of like the stereotypes you see them portrayed as in theater and on TV, you know, the typical gay man who is extremely flamboyant and this, this and that, and which is absolutely fine. And those people exist and their identities should be celebrated, but that's only one kind of queer person. Mm -hmm. um, and there are so many kinds of queer people, like there are so many other people in the world. Um, so I really wanted to start to see just real queer people doing real queer theater or regular theater for that matter. Um, <clears throat> so in that, my mission has always been to commit to inclusive casting, which really just means that we're creating space for representation for everybody. Um, so we're getting into this era now where it's no longer really acceptable for the what you see on stage to not reflect what it looks like in the world. When we walk around outside, we see all sorts of colors and shapes and sizes and identities. And uh, in theater, sometimes we don't see that on the stage. We don't see ourselves represented on the stage. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I use- I interrupt you to say that um, people are pushing for theater. Correct. To transform. Um, yes. And not that it's, fully no longer acceptable, right? And, and that really, I, th I think you're not giving credit for, to, to yourself and uh, honestly your generation um, yeah. to say that like, th that's what you're looking to make happen, right? Yes. You're to join your voice to some voices that are out there that are looking to make that, to make happen. So yeah, I those changes. Make sure yeah, that no, totally. I, yeah, yeah, thank you. Those, those changes are starting to happen. Um, and there are people doing those things, and, and theater is going to be all sorts of things at all, all, all sorts of stages of the game. There is, you know, experimental theater, there is, you know, more traditional theater, there is, you know, theater that is specifically one thing created for one identity, um, and those are all great, and we should celebrate all of those things, um, but my goal is to, to kind of just, you know, like I was saying, make sure that what we see in the world is what we see on stage. Um, so in doing that, I used MSM's infrastructure 
uh, and works very closely with uh, the student affairs team and the production staff and our faculty advisor for, um, excuse me, for Alpha Psi Omega and for all these, and for all, uh, all the people that were helping me in creating my organization and then helping me create this piece of theater. Um, and the people at MSM are just absolutely wonderful and, you know, full tilt supported me from the beginning, which was a, a really great process. I would also respond though that, that you, um, you know, there are, there are structures in place, right? That have to be, we, we can't have it, well, we're an institution, right? So there's, there's yeah. there are resources to manage um, and uh, not everyone has found a way to, to use those structures to move forward to have a, a voice. And so um, I, I agree with you that Melanie and her team are wonderful. Um, but you also ha you had to um, you had to find a way to work within some some structures, so that was important. Um, Subia, do you have your reading ready for us? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, I'm going to read through it. It's only a, a page or so. Uh, this is from my play Agape. You guys are the first ones to hear anything from the play, so let's go. Um, the character is Lena. I needed to feel the rain. I needed to know the kiss of dew and mist, a feeling of pure, unadulterated bliss, knowing that God was listening to my cries and cleansing the earth with her sighs. I needed to feel the rain and to know the promise that I would be renewed by the dew of spring. Aren't I soft? Isn't my flesh penetrable, my heart movable, and my tears, don't they leave streaks down my cheeks? I want it, but love isn't for me. It's for women who get to live, not survive. Every day I feel this incredible suffocation, like every step I take is being measured. Behind every corner there is this incriminating darkness, this evil lurking over my life. I'm not crying. I'm not crying. I will not cry. I'm fine, really. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm fine. I'm not even surprised. That word killed has lost its weight for me. I hear it so often that it no longer registers. When they kill one of us, the community mourns, the community is deadened, a human being is killed, and some feel that they are able to distance themselves. Distance themselves. They can, so they do, and they feel righteous when doing so. In the name of self-care and maintenance of one's mental health, take a break from social media, don't watch the news, don't acknowledge our death, our destruction, because they can. It's their birthright. They will never be killed in this way so they don't have to address that terror. What courage I must have to not even be surprised by death. Something has been lost, something has been stolen and its void is deep, its smile is treacherous and it calls my name. Love, what time have I got for love and why do I want it when I may be next? So that's my character, um, Lena um, Oliver. <laughs> Wow! Yes, that's You're beautiful. <laughs> um, Thank you. I hope I hope our our little virus doesn't get in the way of of uh, being able to experience that at MSM this year. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, thanks so much for giving us the preview. Yeah, you heard it here first, right? Um, uh, Gabriel and Juan, do you have a little bit of uh, of your music to share with us? Oh uh, yeah, uh, you want to? Uh, well, we had a, a also the beginning of a documentary, but I don't know if you want it. If you want me to show you the music right now, let's start um, with the. Let's start with the music. Maybe with, with, with uh, Beam Venezuelan motion. Yeah, no. yeah. So yeah. So wait. So yeah, so we, we are gonna start with the video that says Bean, which is a tune by Gabriel. Uh, and we, we, what we did there is that I recorded a Venezuelan drum that's called Pulo e Puya, which are three little drums, but I put them together and I played the three of them, but this actually is played by one, by one person. Okay. Uh, and, we, and we put that to to a to a Gabrielson. So this is, and uh, we're just gonna show you a little bit, and I'm gonna tell you when to stop, right? So yeah.
Yeah, so that's only like a, a little fragment of the... This is actually, as I say, a Gabriel tune, but we... Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about a little bit. We have two more videos, by the way, if you want to... Okay. You know, put them yeah, later. I get this, this song in particular. Um, it's cool because... So so I just, I just released an album, and this song is not on, on that album, but uh, I just released an album on May 1st. It's called New Beginning which is like a, a book of, of some of the songs that I've been writing during my six years here in New York. Uh, so it, it definitely talks about all of the things that, we, that we've been saying, experience as an immigrant and all of the influence of this New York culture, New York sounds and New York life into my music. And I wrote all of these songs in New York. But this song in particular, I, I, visit, I went to visit uh, Venezuela I, I I needed to get my passport and all of that, and and I was I stayed there for two weeks, and I actually wrote this song uh, in my home in Caracas. So it's like one of the few songs of like the you know that I wrote in Venezuela in this past six years. So I think it has definitely that that connection, you know. So you were you were immersed in feeling that particular vibe at that time. So. You had gotten yes. a, a dose, a new dose. Um, that's great. Um, Juan, you said that, that, that you had a, um, a video. When we talked the other day, we mentioned the fact that uh, our audience may not be, I hope our audience knows a little bit about what's the, you know, the situation in Venezuela, but probably not maybe deeply. So you had a brief video to show us. Yeah, it's, it's really brief. Um, then, uh... Uh, we can talk about it a little bit if we have time or if we want. Uh, it's the video of a DW uh, documentary uh, that's called Oil and Ruin, uh, the Venezuelan Exodus. That's the name. It's on YouTube. You all can watch it later if you want. It's like a two hours uh, documentary. But we just want to put the very beginning, like the first two minutes of it. Uh, you can see one of the uh, biggest, I think it's the biggest uh, hood what we call barrio in Venezuela, which here will be, I think, like the hoods uh, uh, in Caracas. I don't know how long it is, but it's huge. You are, so you're going to see like a, like a drum take mm. uh, of most of it. And, and at the end, you can see Caracas, like the city. And that's where, that's one of the, like, one of the most dangerous uh, hoods in the world. It's like, the favelas in Rio de Janeiro, for example. Uh, so yeah, uh, you're, you're gonna see it uh, in the video. Do, do you have it? Oh yeah, there it is. Coming, yep. Every two seconds, a person is forced to flee their home. Nearly 71 million people around the world have been forcibly displaced, more than ever before. One is Merian Soria, who now lives in Berlin. Every month, she sends money to Venezuela so that her family doesn't go hungry. Hola, hija. Hola. Hola, mi amor. Mi bendición. Bendición. ¿Cómo está, mi pequeñita? Bien. Regálame un besito. Mwah. Bueno, voy a venir para... Tu osito. Para abrazarlo. ¿Cuándo vas a venir pronto, hija? Tú sabes que tenemos que hablar mucho con Diosito para que sea el que nos dé el permiso de Ahora que te para acá, para donde está mami. Alejandra, ¿qué te falta para irte para donde está mami? Mi pasaporte. Tu pasaporte, mi amor. No, yo no tengo sueño, yo quiero hablar contigo, pero tú no quieres hablar conmigo, hija, estás jugando. Ok, pero regálame un besito. Chao. Chao. Ella no quiere hablar. Ok, está bien. Chao. Millions of Venezuelans have left the country, fleeing poverty and despair, even though Venezuela has the largest proven petroleum reserves in the world. Venezuela was once South America's richest nation. Now its economy has collapsed, sparking one of the worst migrant crises of recent years. So, 
th this video is, is, is really powerful because because that scene I mean when I when I, I when I saw it I was you know researching a little bit and I and I saw this documentary it's really interesting but that first scene is like really uh really powerful and, and it gets to the heart because at least for me this is something now common it's like I saw it and I was like yeah uh, this is I've seen this this is what happens so many people left fled the country to be able to work abroad and send some money uh to to their you know to their to their family to their son even one of our friends uh, of our closest friends is here a musician and he's working and he sends money to his son which he which he can he can't bring yet because of passport and all of the things exactly the same conversation so this scene is so close to us to every one of us and and it's like really common and also all of us we talk to our families there that they can't really come visit us here and for some of us it's really dangerous to go down there uh both Juan Diego and I were victims of of the violence in Venezuela because it's, it's not because it's just so common there. Like you, you get mugged or you get, I was like somebody tried to kidnap me once and stuff like that, just, just by being on the streets, you know, uh, because of the economy, it's, it's, it really got uh, to that level. So, so that scene, I, I think it shows a reality for many Venezuelans and many immigrants in the world nowadays. Yeah, it's it, it's like a, for example, I don't know if you guys could see the subtitles. They were like kind of small, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, for example, the 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 mom asked her like, "Oh, what do you need? Oh, she needs the passport." Yeah. One of the most difficult tasks in Venezuela right now. I mean, to just to get a passport, you gotta pay like more than three thousand dollars, for example, yeah. to see if they want to give it to you. I mean, it's like it's a, it's a really really hard process. There are no issuing visas, for example, to the United States. If you are in the, if you are in Venezuela and want to come here, you cannot do it. You gotta, you have to go to Colombia, and go to the embassy there and to ask for a visa there. You know, so there are a lot of kind of uh, uh, limitations yeah. to get out and to come to go to any country, basically. Yeah. So let me ask you this. So obviously, this is, you know. Um, a, a major structural problem right now that Venezuela faces. Um, you can't take that on as just two human beings, um, but you do see your project as 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 being part of change. How how are you in your minds? How are you um, contributing to to Venezuela, to the people of Venezuela, to social change for Venezuelans? through your jazz music? Well, I, I wanna, maybe one wants to talk about that too, but I wanna say one of the things that has become like a trend the last 20 years in Venezuela is that everything is so bad and everything is like, you know, we have the worst inflation and the inflation, like, it's like, you know, every day everything is going uh, like everything gets expen more expensive, the economy is worse, there's more killings. You just see, like if you watch the news and if you're like on the Venezuela, like following the thing, you just see negative things. Mm -hmm. You don't really see anything positive. And it's like, it, it has been, it has become a culture even for, even for Venezuelans. And this is really important. And it's maybe a problem that we can talk about that they kind of enjoy talking about how bad we are and how worse everything is like like it has become kind of a trend for venezuelans like oh the coffee now is ten dollars and the coffee tomorrow is 15 and it's like yes the ter the situation is very bad but since everything is bad i think we only because we're creating something positive it's like some good news for venezuelan people it's a huge huge help really and this i'm talking as a Venezuelan, like myself, every time I see something positive, a fellow Venezuelan <clears throat> uh, winning a Grammy, for example, or having a successful career, or somebody having a successful business in the U.S. and then being able to to send some food and some money, I'm just glad that 
any Venezuelan I know have a successful career because all of the Venezuelans you probably know, they are sending some money at least to Venezuela because people there leave from the money that, that, that gets from, uh, from their families outside. Now everybody in Venezuela has some, somebody abroad and that's how the economy really uh, is, is moving because yeah. people there can't like the, the work is really minimum and all of that. So the fact that we're doing something positive, something artistic, it's like a, a, a breathe, you know, that people can breathe and see something mm -hmm. positive of, or their, of their fellow Venezuelans uh, outside of the country and give them some hope, hopefully. So, you know, Sylvia, I, I don't want to mischaracterize, so I hope I got this right. But what I heard in the piece that you shared was um, giving voice to pain, which is a different kind of relief, but similarly a relief, I think. You know, Gabrielle's speaking about um, offering something positive um, and, and then creating hope. And, with, with what I heard from you, it was, it was putting into words um, some real and, and sh possibly shared emotions. Um, I don't know how things turn out for Lena um, and what you're, you know, and, and to what extent that she, she's an inspiration, but, um, but, but maybe by your acknowledging pain and giving hope, perhaps. Yeah, there, there are there, I want to say there has to be hope because without hope, what what is what is life without hope? There has to be hope. Um, but but these issues, um, these issues that we're broadly all giving voice to, are issues that, of course, deal with deep pain and deep trauma and deep suffering. So I'm also looking forward to hopefully shedding light on how healing can occur. Hmm. Um, there's a very big healing process in Agape, and you see the character Lena and other characters undergo healing. Um, there's also, within this play, a, um, a sexual trauma. So you see how a character undergoes healing from that as well. Um, so so I, I agree that healing and hope are very necessary things. And whenever I heal, hear something, positive that has to do with with my community as well i i agree with you it does something good to the spirit you know that's why i love comedy because it it just it does great things to the spirit but um yeah that's yeah. great um joseph one of our someone in our audience asked for the full uh, name of the uh the organization um the national theater organization chapter that you started yeah, so it is the national organization is called Alpha Psi Omega. And then the chapter that we started at MSM is the Mu Sigma Mu chapter um, after MSM. <laughs> um, so that is, so we went to the national office and they gave us permission to start a chapter um, through our student affairs department. Um, and I, I don't think you have too much you can show us about that since the play didn't happen. But can you talk a little bit about what you hoped would be achieved by inclusive casting? Um, and um, and then maybe if you have, I know you have some visuals related to queer PBS. Um, and if you could talk about, if you wanna show them to us and if, and if you do, if you could talk to us a little bit about what you see in those pictures that, that's important to you. Sure. Um, so with, Jesus Christ Superstar, um, in particular, you know, for me, it's such, uh, for me personally, it's such a, a beautiful and, you know, scintillating story about uh, a person and all the things that they go through. I mean, I guess that you could say that about any piece of theater. It's a beautiful and interesting story about a person. Um, but it, it's a really deeply emotional story that most of us know because it is an old story from the Bible. Um, and I thought, what better way to bring in this idea of inclusive casting than to a story that everybody knows. Um, because I, I think because you know the story, the audience can come in and say, it doesn't matter who's telling the story, I know the story, I can follow you in this journey. Um, and one of the questions that I wanted people to ask themselves when they came in is, you know, why does it matter if gender is flipped? Why does it matter if my 
idea of this character of this person that I knew from history is not who it is now that I'm seeing. Um, and that's just a question I really wanted people to ask themselves and, they ask, uh, and the actors to ask themselves as well what it meant to them to be, you know, for example, like I said, the role of Jesus was a woman. So, uh, uh, was played by a female identified actress and traditionally is a male identified part. Um, so, you know, you have to ask the actress, what does it mean to you to bring your femininity along with you into this part? Um, do you lose it? Do you emphasize it? Um, do you find a balance in between? Um, for my two cents, I wanted people to be able to really explore fluidity and sexuality and gender um, within their role, um, mm -hmm. regardless of what they identified as and regardless of what the part identified as. So I really was hoping and continue to hope and try that, uh, to push the envelope of what inclusive casting means um, and to make people think differently about how we can cast people. Um, because like I said, we, you know, we really want to start to see a representation of all of us, all of our beautiful identities, all the people here on this panel who have wonderful, wonderful talents and identities. We want to start to see that on the stage, um, regardless of how it was done 30 years ago, regardless of how it was done yesterday. Um, so we want to continue to push that, that envelope and start to see ourselves on the stage and ask those questions. Um, so I'm hoping that that, you know, granted the production did not happen, so I did not get to see that come to fruition. I didn't get to see the audience reaction to that. Um, but I'm hoping that it continues to inspire and, and ask those, those questions of, of casting people um, to continue to think, well, why does it matter? Or how can I continue to create space for all identities to be up there? Um, so that was, that and then we were talking about queer PBS mm -hmm. as well. So um, we have a couple of pictures which we can uh, go through now from our annual ball. So each year, the two years that I was running queer PBS, um, we threw this ball, which you can see these wonderful people up on the stage. Um, so the proceeds for the ball went to Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. Um, and I think what was most important about this experience is it was a really brave space for people to come out and be who they were in any number of ways. You know, sexual identity, gender identity, a social identity. You know, people could finally just come out and express themselves uh, freely for a night. Um, and it also gave other students who may come from areas of the world or areas of the country where they're not as familiar with, you know, the LGBTQ plus spectrum. Oh, and there's me, by the way, looking good. <laughs> um, as I was saying, it, might, it, it was a space for people who weren't as familiar with LGBTQ plus spectrum to be able to, you know, just be social with, with people and they may not have known you know, all the different identities and the celebrations and the, you know, drag culture and queer culture and all the things that we brought to the table that night. Um, so it was a really wonderful space and time for people to explore that uh, and to be exposed to that <clears throat> in a way that they may not have been able to do before. That's great. Um, I wanted to just say that, that you have some shout outs from our audience. Um, all of you, uh, to all of you that you are uh, you know, so uh, amazing, in addition to all the hard work you put at MSM, you are also going, be going beyond the doors and leading, very inspiring. And then specifically from one of your MT colleagues uh, to Subia, amazing Subia, one standing ovation for writing something, a second standing ovation for sharing it, and a third standing ovation for it being so amazing. All the standing ovations are for you. So, so I guess your your uh, your little preview hit hits um, with some success already. <laughs> um, it's wonderful. So I, I think, as I said at the top of this panel um, panel discussion, which is our last panel of MSM perspective, so we hope to have a couple of interviews um, later this summer. Um, that it, what really struck me was how um, with 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 the artist panel at the beginning of the summer was how those these artists who are I think all middle-aged uh, um, or approaching or 
uh, just going beyond, um, have uh, you know have had success through their through their hard work and through their talent, but also through um, being true to, true to themselves and that that truth to themselves and their um, you know not disconnecting their their voices and their visions of social change from their art has really served that group well. Um, and it's maybe a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because sometimes you think, well, I'll have to compromise, right? To move forward in the world. But at least with that group of people, that wasn't what I saw when I listened to them. Um, and that's not what I see when I listen to you all. Um, every life has some compromise, but to keep that at the center, those, those ideas about yourself and the, your vision for the world and your art, um, seems to be serving you all well to date. Um, I think everyone on, on, of those artists on the panel had to find their own spaces, places where they could be heard as artists. Um, and that's a challenge. I think that's probably a challenge for all artists. Um, but you all seem to be um, off to a really good start in, in finding those spaces um, to put your, yourself and your art forward. So I think that's really exciting. Um, and it's just a privilege to be um, the Dean of Students at MSM, it's always a privilege, um, but it's a privilege to be here with you all today and to hear a little bit about that. Um, I know that there are many, many students at MSM who we could feature on something like this, um, and hopefully we'll have a chance at some point to, to, to broaden, right, and to hear from more of our students. But thank you for representing MSM students, for representing yourselves. Um, and for sharing your stories with us, um, because I think we all can, can learn from each other's stories. Stories are powerful. Um, Juan, uh, maybe as, as, a, as a part of our exit, I'll, I'll stop talking, we'll all stop talking, and can we hear one more piece? You said you had another one. Uh, yeah, Gabriel, you wanna put uh, the gallery show? The show, they just, or you wanna put the other one? No, sure, the gallery show. So. The gallery yeah. show. So, so yeah, this is a concert. Well, actually, you talk about it. <laughs> what? But you have you have the minutes because I know it's. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. He has uh, he has the minutes. He has the okay, segment. Cool, it's cool. like minutes thirty six or something. He has it. Okay. Um. Yeah. This this was a show at the jazz gallery. It's, it was my first show at the jazz gallery. Uh, presenting the music of of this album called New Beginning. And I, I'm really uh, glad and honored that I, I, I had this amazing band, including Juan, playing vibes and percussion, and, uh, and, and Jungkook Kim, amazing drummer, and uh, who else was playing? Dean Torrey on bass, Morgan Gang. So you can, you can let's, let's hear some of the music. This, this song is inspired in a, in a, in a, town, in a town called Kumboto. Uh, and it's a specific genre rhythm from Venezuela. <laughs> That was not my convention. It was inspired by, by a traditional song. And then, as you can see, a lot of other elements to it, you know. <laughs> yeah, like traditional Afro-Venezuelan drums and all that stuff. But yeah, they are on the scene, on the, on the stage, sorry. 
Yeah, Wonder if you want to check it out, the, the album is called New Beginning. This is, I think, the third song of the album, if you want to hear more. And, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, uh, in our, in our Q&A, we have uh, a, quite a few more compliments for all of you from the faculty. Um, and uh, I just wanted to pass that on. Um, I, think we'll call, we'll, I think we'll end here. Um, thank you all for participation. Uh, thank you for being, I think, the tip of the iceberg at MSM. Um, and uh, thank you to our audience for joining us and um, for uh, allowing us to share our students' story. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having thank us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Bye. Bye. Bye.